uh, like role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons or I keep Paula with me so that I understand all the culture. I'm hip. I could get even worse and just ask if you were a Titan Mage from uh, <laughs> which would really throw people off. Well see the thing is I work for myself, so I can give myself any title that I want. So I have been like a senior technical fellow. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I I use A7 computer level expert. Yeah, uh, That's I, obscure, right? right? I've been a PowerShell sensei. Uh, for today, I'm going to be a PowerShell mage, because maybe there'll be some magic what I'm going to show you. So we're supposed to spend roughly two hours um, talking about a topic that I've called accelerated tool making. Uh, PowerShell commands, oh yeah, all that. Um, Jeff, I, yeah. Go to Mobility Center and tell it that you're presenting. It'll be fine, it'll be fine. Um, what were they talking about? Oh yeah, what we're talking about here. Uh, copy of PowerShell commands. Um, I do a lot of scripting and I have built my own set of tools to help me build tools faster. I'm assuming most of you have written a PowerShell script or tool, but correct me. Yeah. Um, and it can be kind of a tedious process, so we're always looking for shortcuts and other ways to do that. So that's kind of the, the premise for my talk today, is what can you do to kind of speed up this process? And I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Again, those of you just here, you've seen this slide many times. Um, it's kind of amazing that I've known a number of these people for 10 years. That's really kind of hard for me to get my head around sometimes. All right, so those of you who don't know me, and <clears throat> there are people who don't. I was at a bar last night, and someone recognized Adam Bertram, and then he turned to me and said, who are you? I loved it. <laughs> Perfectly fine. It made Adam's night. So um, now I am a grizzled IT Pro veteran. Um, not quite as um, grizzled as Richard Sudway or Mark here, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if, if someone's got to be, you know, the old alpha IT pros, and I've been around, I've seen a lot of things, and I try to bring all of that experience to the work that I do and the books that I write, the classes that I teach, the sessions, the blog articles, all of that. I'm a longtime PowerShell uh, MVP, all well, cloud and data center now, but I, I know, I'm still going to always call myself a PowerShell MVP. The whole cloud and data center, that's just too much to, to say. Uh, I, I am a PowerShell teacher, author. I've written a few books. Um, I do some consulting and project work. Uh, so some of you know me, have seen me. I've been around a bit. Uh, I do a lot of my writing at Petri.com. I do courses for Pluralsight. And I am pretty active on Twitter. I've got a slide at the end that has all my contact information. All right, so getting into this here. So what's the problem? Well, you have some sort of PowerShell scripting or tool making requirement. Someone has come to you and said, hey, we need a tool or a script to do X. And you look around and go, oh, well, you know, we have this one PowerShell command, and it does almost everything that we need to do. Almost. If we just had like maybe one more parameter, or maybe if it didn't have a particular parameter, or if I could just combine this with another command, it would be perfect. Now, I could, me, and I'm talking in, in, in your stead, say, I'm a partial expert, yet yeah, I could sit and I would know what to type. But often you're building stuff for other people. You don't want them to have to rely on knowing what to type, how to plug stuff together. You want to build brain dead simple tools, right? So how do we get there? You may also need a tool or a script or something for delegation. If you're building a server, you have a constrained endpoint, you want to put something on there that you're going to delegate to the help desk or junior IT admin or an end user, or perhaps you're even using GIA. And again, you want to have some sort of tool in place that is based on something that is there now, but more customized to do exactly what you need to have done. Now, instead of reinventing the wheel, just build a better wheel. 
Now, for, fortunately, and I'm going to show you some gimmicks or tricks or hacks or tools that I have built to help speed up this process of building a better wheel. Because like you, the last thing I want to do is open up Visual Code or IC or PowerShell Studio, whatever tool you're using, POM requires X version 4.0, and, and type everything out. I'm assuming most of you use things like templates and have other snippets and all these other tools to help speed up the process. Well, what I want to talk about today is some other ways we can speed up this process of building tools. So I have this little kind of a copy a command concept. And this idea of copying a command, you can go down two paths. And we're going to look at both paths. I've got lots of demonstrations of this is the command I started with, this is what I ended up with, and we'll walk through and look at it so you can see the change that I made. Everything I'll show you, I will share at some point. Uh, follow me on Twitter, because that's probably where I'll announce where to go to get the, the download link. So we have a proxy version. A proxy version is a way of creating kind of a copy of the command, but you actually are still running, when you get to running it, the actual command. And you'll see that. Anyone here ever build a proxy function? A few, OK. Was it easy to do? In some ways, it's kind of easy. Um, I'm going to try to show you how to, how to speed up that process. I mean, it actually is easy, because it's really almost a two-step process. You run this command, and then get through whatever command you want, and that will create a object that has command metadata, basically the parameters and the script blocks and all the stuff that defines that command. <clears throat> you then create a new proxy function. And again, I've got more code examples here. And then you edit. Take away what you don't need, add in what you do need, and when you're done, you have a new command. Your proxy command can have a totally new name, or you can reuse the name. Personally, I always come up with new names. I'm not. The only reason you would create a proxy command with the same name is if you were going to be doing some delegation, probably with GIA. Uh, for the most part, though, the tools that I build, um, I'm building to help me do my work and help other people. I don't really do a lot with delegation right now. Uh, maybe once GIA really matures in V5, I'll move into that more and look into that. But And you'll see all these in action in a moment. The other approach I take is create what I call a wrapper function. And probably many of you have built things like this. It's a function, <clears throat> get foo that at the very heart of it, then call some other PowerShell command. Those can be kind of tedious to write because you have to generate the help. And, uh, how many of you just love, wrote, love writing comment-based help? <laughs> <laughs> so hire June and no, she'll write like her PowerShell comment. PowerShell Studio, you right-click your function and click Generate PowerShell, <coughs> Generate Yeah, question where you like writing help. Okay. So we got a few people who like writing help. <coughs> You'll see that I don't write help, I copy it. Um, and But you also then assume most of the same parameters for your underlying function or underlying command that you are calling, but you have to type, do a lot of typing or manual copying and pasting. And when I build my wrapper functions, I leverage splash. So I'm going to assume that the parameters for my wrapper function are mostly the same parameters for the underlying command, which makes it really easy to just splat PF bound parameters right to that command. So it makes my code really simple to look at. And I'm all about having really simple looking code. All right, any questions so far? You still have time to go to Josh's session, or I think Tim's still doing something on Azure, or I'm sure they're serving alcohol somewhere in town. All right, so that, that's really all the slides I have. So I'm going to go into PowerShell, walk through lots of demos. Um, we'll come back to slides, ask questions, give you a few 
references. Ten minutes for slides. Okay, so now we have a lot of time. And I am wearing, okay. So I have my, I, well, you know, you reach, remember, grizzled. So I have, you know, two sets of glasses. I've got glasses so I can see you or glasses so I can see my laptop. Um, so I'm going to wear, because I'm going to be looking primarily in type. So I can mostly see you, or you're not too fuzzy, but if you have any questions, just kind of raise your hand or just shout it out. And let's uh, look at some magic here. Now, even though um, I'm running PowerShell 5 on Windows 10, everything I'm doing should run on Windows or PowerShell probably 3 even or later. I tend to put a requirement of at least version 4 because I think everyone should be at least at version 4 at this point for anything running on your desktop. I don't, yeah, there's nothing that I'm doing that is version 5 specific. So if you're not at V5 yet, you know, you don't have to worry about anything. So let's kind of walk through all of this process. And let's just run <clears throat> get command. Sorry, so you all, know, you all know get command retrieves the a command info object about whatever command you specify. It can be either a commandlet name or an alias or a function. In this case, I just am going to use the full commandlet name. So we're going to start off by kind of looking at this proxy approach. So I'm going to get the command metadata for $C. And that dollar command, that object now, is pretty rich. There's a lot of actual useful stuff here that I think a lot of people skip. Now I'm going to go through manually through a lot of these steps, and then I'll show you my, my cheat, my automation tool, which will speed up the entire process. Than just what you do if you looked at all the properties of get service? Of, that, get, of the command info object. A lot of it's, it, it's the same information. Right. But this object, this automation command metadata, right. has some additional methods. Thank you. Okay. Which we're going to take that advantage of here. That command does not have. Right. So it's more than just the properties, there are some methods to this object that we will invoke to make the magic happen. So, like any object, of course, you know, you can drill down. So you can look at the parameters to get a hash table. This will be the same type. You can get the same type of information by doing get command and looking at the parameters. It's still there. We're just looking at it at a different way. And I'm showing you all of this so that you can understand where, when I get to copying and pasting, where the data is coming from. Okay, so it's coming from objects like this. And the, <clears throat> oh, actually, I I'm, might I'm take that back. I may have misspoken here. Let's pipe dollar CMD. Get member. It's force. So actually, the methods we're going to use are for a different class. I misspoke. I'm an IT pro veteran, not a developer veteran. So we're going to take advantage of the system management automation proxy class, and that has a static method called get param block. And the param we're going to specify is our command metadata. So it's going to be another way of parsing that hash table of parameter information. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, you know, and if you have a laptop, you can follow along with some of this. I'm not going to go really fast. <clears throat> so now we can see, question. Is this all going to work for homemade uh, commandlets and modules as well? If I cook one up, does it get that same sort of respect? Yeah, the truth, yeah. So if, if you have, I assumed it did, but I want to make sure. Um, I think the only thing I would make sure of, if, if you wanted to copy one of your functions, 
is I'll make sure that you are using a command binding attribute. Yeah, right, right. sure. So it's well, all the advanced foot functions. So. Right, yeah. so if, if you have an advanced function, the, the get command doesn't really care. It's going to still find the same information. Yeah, and get command works on simple functions, I assume. Right, I don't know about if the, about the if command metadata, the metadata will work unless you're using that commandlet. I always use commandlet binding attribute in my functions. Um, Anyway, so there is the, the parameter information. This is the parameter block. Now, there are some things there that we're, we're going to copy this later, and eventually you'll see how I fix this. I'm not a big fan, for example, of the way that they lay out the parameter names. So instead of being dollar name, it's dollar and then the and curly braces and then name. It works fine. I'm sure there's a legitimate .NET reason for them. To do that, um, and one reason is if you have parameter name with a space, you would have to do that, but you don't build parameter names with spaces, right? If you do... <laughs> <laughs> you get just what you deserve. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you can see I have all of the parameter attributes, um, any aliases, the, the type, so all the information is right there. We can also use this class, and again, looking at the command, to get the different blocks of the command. Now, every commandlet and advanced function is going to have three blocks, right? Your begin, process, and end script block. So I can use this magic here and say, what's in the begin script block? Remember, what we're looking at here is what is in, going to end up in a proxy function. Once we get to this in an IC tab, I'll go through in a bit more detail. But there's the begin block. We then have the process block, which is really just running the command. We'll come back to this in a moment. And of course, the end block, which is ending the pipeline. What's also nice is that we can get the help for the command. We're going to again still use this proxy command object, this class, and there's a method called get help comments, and the parameter has to be the help content. So I'm just having kind of a nested get help command for get service. And you could certainly use variables. You see my um, acceleration tool, that's what I'm doing. What this will do is, well, let's select that, run that. This gives you all of the help, basically in a text format. And you see where this is going? Because I can now start getting the pieces I want, and in that sense, copying and pasting them into a new command. So if I'm, yeah. Is this with commands implemented in .NET? Um, no, no, this is only going to work for a commandlet or a function. This won't work with any native .NET class, like the math class, for example. Um, for something like that, you could look to classes in V5 and build something new around that. If we have time, I have something that we can at least get a peek at to give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, but that's kind of, let's we'll see how quickly we get through this. Yeah, everything I'm showing you assumes that the command you're copying is just that. It's a command. It's not a .NET class. <clears throat> so then, if we wanted to, we could go ahead and create the actual proxy command. This is the second line that I had in my slide. <clears throat> and I'm just, yeah, I'm actually... I should change this because actually I am using V5, has some clipboard commandlets now. So. Uh, it's also, I think PSVX has had one for a while. Yeah, or you can just pipe it to clip. Yeah. Which, and you know, a number of ways you could do it. Um, so now, if I come here, do a new, paste it in. Uh. So there's the proxy command that basically took. I, I wanted you to see the different little pieces 
because eventually I'm going to break those out. But if you just break the whole proxy command like they did there, then you get all of that. So now all you have to do is just start whittling away or adding in what you need. Okay? Okay, Jane? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been, so I've been writing proxy functions for years, and I did not know this. And I've just been copying all the stuff. Yeah, I know. Thank wow. you. Okay, okay. This is the only way I know to create a proxy function. <laughs> Now, now, granted, though, it's not necessarily documented very well. well not a lot of people know about it. <clears throat> so there's some things here that you would probably want to get rid of or fix. For example, <clears throat> unless for, this is all just right now a script. So let's say I was building, this is for a get service, right? So I'm going to define my new functions, call it get my service. All right, so let's look at some things we would have to fix manually. And you're so welcome to, to kind of go through manually because maybe this will be most of what you need. Because this is going to be my version of get service, I don't really want the help link for online to go to Microsoft. You can, I suppose, but I'm going to delete that. I'm going to delete because I really don't need remoting capability. But I do like that it gives me, <clears throat> if the command has parameter sets, that it concludes all that parameter set information for me, including the default. That's good. Um, I may go and add additional parameters or parameter sets, but at least what I'm starting with is good. I can then come here. See, I'm a big, and this is just a personal preference. I would prefer this to look like dollar name without the curly braces. So you could go through and modify all the parameters. If I'm building this and I say, you know what, I don't want to have the required services parameter, I can just delete it. If I want to add a parameter, I can go through and add a parameter. When we get to some of my before and after, you'll see how I, I do that. I'm just going to kind of give you a feel for how this proxy function works. The main part is here in the begin block. <laughs> <clears throat> so this line here is basically going to build a wrapped command that's going to call the underlying command. So the assumption is that wherever you're going to run this, whatever that underlying command is, it exists on the machine where you're running it, right? So we're going to take that wrapped command, and this is basically just kind of a, <clears throat> a script block that we're going to build here with dollar script cmd, this line here. This script block, it's really quite simple. All it's saying is take the underlying command, which is the wrap CMD, invoke it, and then splat whatever comes through PS bound parameters, which is just a hash table. You get that every time you have a parameter <coughs> defined when they run the command. So often what I will do, just for debugging purposes, is I might have here in the begin block, I add things like write verbose, it has to be a string. So then when I run my command with verbose, I can see what the PS bound parameters were. It helps me when I'm trying to debug to figure out, okay, how come this isn't working? I want to be able to see what is going through. Those bound parameters, are those just named parameters? Yes, they are the named parameters. This is where sometimes it can be a little tricky. Um, but that's why I do that, so I can see exactly <clears throat> what is coming through. Because if I set some defaults, sometimes that 
can work sometimes not, so I need to look, I want to be able to see what is coming through the command, what's going to get passed to the command. And then, hold on just a moment yep. before I jump the train of thought here. Yep. And then I will also, <clears throat> if I need to, if I, let's say I've added a new parameter, it's called dollar test. Don't know what it's going to do, but I'm going to add some. What I will need to do, though, does get service know anything about the test parameter? No. So if I, but if I pass dollar test into my new proxy command, it will fail because get service says I don't know what dash test is. And remember, all I'm doing is splatting. Now I can still use that parameter. You'll see this in my. Um, I get my before and after shots, but what I tend to do then, actually what I tend to do, you have to do, <clears throat> is remove that parameter. There are things you can do to test it and if it exists and then remove it, I just, just get this to, I typically just do that. If it's there, because when you remove it, you get either true or false right into the pipeline. Um, so I just, I just do that. I just say, remove it. I don't really care if I get a message or not. Just make sure it's gone. I can still use dollar test in my code later. And what I typically will do <coughs> is modify the wrapped command. So instead of using wrapped command to get the parameters, I'm probably going to expand that or do whatever it is that I want to do. Most everything else will stay the same. Because at that point, all I'm going to do is just pass the parameters to them when I can. Now, there's some questions over here. You, uh, you mentioned when you debugging, you sometimes put out PS found parameters. But if you're actually using the debugger, PS found parameters still doesn't show up. Is that I, well, I do with the verbose statement. So I just run the command with guess verbose, and I can see it. Okay. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not, I really, I rarely use dash debug yeah. because I'm doing stuff with right verbose. I put all my verbose messaging in from the very beginning so I can see exactly what is going on. Okay. And one of the reasons I do that is if I give a, build a tool for someone and they report, I'm having a problem, it's not working, <clears throat> I can say start a transcript, run my command, with death for both, save the transcript, send it to me. Then I can see exactly what's going on. Um, and because one thing you have to remember when you're building PowerShell scripts and tools is you always have to think about who is going to be running this. Is it going to be you? Is it going to be someone with, who barely can type two letters without making a typo? How will they use? Will they assume? to take something from one command and pipe it to your command. So you have, to, you have to take those things into account. Do I need, and I've done this in some of my commands, well, I'll have some verbose information at the very beginning that will also write out the computer name, the operating system, the user account, other kind of meta command information so that it helps me figure out, okay, why isn't this working for you? Oh, well, you're running PowerShell version three and for whatever reason, this isn't working on version three or whatever. You <coughs> include as much verbose information as you want but that can help you if you have to support or troubleshoot why your command's not working. And there was another question there. Yeah, for the PS found parameters got removed, you have to use the string of the variable name. To that is correct. Um, PS found parameters is just a hash table. Okay. So you can use the the, the, the dot method I to, to test, there's some methods to test if keys exist and all, I just remove it. Okay. And conversely, you can also, if you are splatting and building another hash table, you can just add that. But in this case, for the proxy function, I need to remove anything that I add because the underlying command will have no concept of what that is. <clears throat> I can still use dollar test, that variable, that parameter, anywhere else in my code, it doesn't get rid of the parameter, it just removes it from PF bound parameters. 
<laughs> oh, and then the last thing <clears throat> with the proxy command, by default, and this is one of the, for me, one of the downsides of creating a simple proxy command with the steps I just showed you is all I get is forward and help. That's eh, not going to help me a whole lot. Now I've got to go back and copy and paste and get the help and paste it in. That's too much work for me. I'm late. Um, I don't want to have to work very hard. But that's what the kind of the, the layout of a proxy function. Before we get to my solution, which simplifies and takes us to the next level, any other questions over at least what this looks like? We'll get some examples where you can see the before and after and we'll, we'll run them and so you can kind of follow through. This is, one, <clears throat> this is one of those things where I think the more you see it, the more it sinks in and go, oh, now I get it. I understand where you're, you're going with that. So we're all good? All right, so let's come here and look at my accelerator tools. Uh, if <clears throat> get the right line. So the first script I have here is a function called get command metadata. It kind of automates a lot of the steps that I just walk through. I actually have two commands we're going to look at. This is the first one. The second one takes this to a next level. I want to show you this just so, because this, this may be all you need for some of your needs. So, <clears throat> what this is going to do, and we'll just skip the help here, you have to specify the name of a PowerShell command. You can specify the name of your new command if you want. And you can also specify if you want to include dynamic parameters. All right, so one thing I didn't talk about in my previous example, <clears throat> a lot of, number of commandlets have what are called dynamic <coughs> parameters, which means you don't necessarily see them unless some certain condition is met. It can make it tricky to try to identify those things when you're building a proxy command or doing it in my copying command process I'm going to show you. So I have a, a switch there that will say, if there happen to be dynamic parameters, go ahead and include them as well. I almost always, when I run this, include that because I don't know for a fact which command might have a dynamic parameter or not. Now, I do know through painful trial and error that a lot of the Active Directory commandlets are pretty much all the parameters are dynamic. For whatever reason that escapes me, the developers on the AD team decided everything will be dynamic parameter. Because they don't know how to write commands. Yeah, and I wasn't going to say that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, no one could hear that on the recording. Um, so when I was building some proxy commands for some Active Directory tools, I that's how I realized, oh, I have to include coverage for dynamic parameters. And I'll show you how that works. <clears throat> I'll show you how that works here. All right, so I'm kind of stepping through. Uh, if I do include an alias for the command, then I just resolve that command name because I need the actual underlying command in order to get all the command information, not the alias. And you'll notice here, for example, you know, talking about my right verbose. And when I run this, I run it with verbose so you can see. I have a lot of verbose messages so you can see, if you were running this, what every step is doing. The other advantage, kind of a sidebar here, with the verbose messages, documentation, right? The message, you, as you're reading through the script, you can see, oh, that's what this next section is going to do. So if you build this all in as you're running your script, when you're done, You've got your script documented. And you have useful feedback information for debugging and troubleshooting. All right, so we, um, here on line 65, 
we get that command metadata. We saw that command before. I then create the new name. If you specify a new name, I'll do that. Otherwise, just use the existing name. Now, this is a kind of a tricky part. This uh, I had to add this from the Active Directory stuff. It's very possible to have a command that when you get command metadata, there are no parameters. That's what happens with the Active Directory commands. But there are parameters there, right? But they're all dynamic. So I have some logic here that says, if you do a get param block and you find no parameters, let's assume that there probably are some, and let's automatically, even though you didn't specify it, let's go ahead and get dynamic parameters. So I kind of take advantage, and so you don't have to remember to do it, I do it, I force you to do it. Otherwise you wouldn't see anything for it, at least the AD command lets. So if you, once you do that, if you get those parameters, even though nothing shows, you can use the get enumerator, and there is a property that you can measure the C of, it's a Boolean of is dynamic. So if I enumerate the properties, of, or I'm sorry, enumerate the parameters, and I detect that some are dynamic, I just add them to the hash table of my um, that parameters property. So it's my kind of workaround to look at what's dynamic and then manually let's kind of copy them up to the parent parameters hash table. So that way I can get all of the parameters. I get the the command help. Now, I do this for you, no charge. You know, the command help, if I'm copying, say, get service, all the examples will all say get service. Well, my command is going to be called get my service. And I may want to use some of those same examples or some of the other text in the, in the description. So I use a, the replace operator and just replace get service with my new name. That seems pretty simple. Remember, I'm lazy. I don't have to do a lot of hunting and replacing, so let's do that. I also set the help URI to null. I then create the command metadata. In this section here, okay, hold on, it's regular expressions, don't freak out. I'm not gonna try to Teach you that pattern, just know that it works. Uh, curly braces. <laughs> yeah, basically replacing the curly braces. <clears throat> um, I wrote this number years ago. I might be able to refine that regex, but it works, so I'm just going to let it be. Um, so, yeah, so I'm cleaning up because I also want <coughs> the name of the, to move up. Because I like having. String and then the name of the variable or name of the parameter. So that's my little magic to make that happen. I also use a regex to find where the <clears throat> that forwarded help, those forwarded help links are, because I don't want that. Because I'm going to copy and paste the actual help. So I want to I use regex to Get rid of that <coughs> and repl <coughs> replace that. Basically, wherever it finds the forwarded links, it just replaces it with null, basically deletes it. And then at this part here, building a here string. This is the new command. And all I'm doing with the here string is putting in all the information that I pulled to the proxy command and the parameters and just plugging it in. And that is saved to a variable. If you happen to run this in the PowerShell IC, which I always do, then I create a new tab and it inserts the text. Otherwise, it just writes it to the pipeline. 
and even create an alias for my command. Any questions on how any of that works before I show you how it works? So let's dot source that. And I'm going to make a copy of the, because I run Hyper-V, so I want to make a copy of the get VM commandlet. And I don't think it has any dynamic parameters, but I'm going to go ahead and do dynamic. Oh, and let's, I said I was going to do this. Let's turn on the dash verbose. This will all work. All right, so there's all the verbose output, so I can see if something had failed somewhere along the way, I would know at what point I had to go back and look. That's pretty simple. <clears throat> so here is the final command. I'm going to notice, see, I called it get VM. Notice in the help, I changed all the help going to hide the help for now. Now, I take that back. My little magic isn't perfect. It does get rid of the curly braces, but it doesn't move it up. So that's not that bad. I just have to come here, hit delete a couple times, you know, clean this up the way I want it to be. But those are, <clears throat> those are all the parameters. And then I have the commands. You know, the proxy command. And so I've got the help, it's all cleaned up, it has my names. All I have to do is, again, whittle away what I don't want and add what I do want. So let's, let me see my next demo. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. We're going to come back, I'm going to do another version of this so you can see, again, the before and after. So that's get command metadata, which is designed to create, basically, a rapid way of creating a proxy function that you can then modify. I realized that, you know, I want to go more than that. I may want a wrapper function, where I don't, really, I don't want a proxy. I want, so I'm probably still going to call the underlying command, but for whatever reason, I want to build a wrapper around it. But again, I don't want to have to try to find all the parameters and retype them and the help and all of that. So I built a second version <clears throat> of my script. And I'm going to let's close some of these things here. <coughs> and we don't need that. This tool actually is on GitHub. So my GitHub repo is JDHIP Solutions. Um, it's also a link on my blog, or ping me on Twitter if you can't find it. So let's, let's see, this is this command. We'll just hide the help. I also realize, in, after I finished that first function, that even though it was get, getting rid of forwarded help, well, there may be some instances where I do want to use forwarded help because I'm still going to create a new version of get service. It's going to override, and I'm still going to call it get service, and I want to show the forwarded help. So I want to be able to include that as an option. So I have a parameter there, a switch. Say, so go ahead and use it <clears throat> if it's there. So don't basically don't delete it. Um, the default behavior for this command is to create a wrapper function. Or I can use it as proxy, and it's going to do the same, this is going to use a lot of the same code that I just showed you is in this command. <clears throat> the big difference is here. Let's find the help is that as I go through, I'm, again, I'm building 
a here string. <clears throat> and if I'm specifying a proxy command, then it will go in and add the proxy pieces. Otherwise, it just uses the different commands that I showed you with that proxy object, the, the proxy command class, to get the different pieces that I want and then manually paste them in. Uh, the difference being, so I'm inserting the parameters. The big difference is when I define here on line 220, that process, that is what will show up in the eventual command that I'm creating. So I can either create the proxy version of it, or I can just build a wrapper that's going to run the command and then splat pfbon parameters. At least as a starting point. You'll see some of my examples again before and after where I go a little bit further than that. And even in my copied commands, you'll notice I have I'm inserting right verbose commands. So you have no choice but to use them. All right, so let's see how this works in action. So I'm going to run get command, again, with get VM, call get my VM, include dynamic as a proxy. This is basically, this will give me, oh, no, 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 don't run the script. Now I need to do, for those of you who ever do presentations, like I'm doing where you're walking through a script and I never do it, <coughs> put a return keyword at the very beginning of your script file that you're walking through. So if you do like I did and accidentally hit F5, it'll hit return and then stop. It won't run through all of my... I busted many of demo by not putting that in. <clears throat> all right, so we are going to create, basically recreate that proxy version of get VM. few differences. Um, I've inserted a little header metadata so it shows who created this. So it's a copy of what command, who created it, when they created it. I just, personally, I find that useful. I put in my standard disclaimer. <clears throat> um, I'm using the help. The help has all been modified. Oh, this version, I fixed my issues with the parameters. So now I get everything up in length the way that I want it to be. I have all of the parameter sets <clears throat> and the names. <clears throat> and now I have the begin process and end script blocks just like we had before with a proxy command. I can go through and modify this as necessary. So what I did, let's just, so this is the before. So you can see <clears throat> I have this, all, the, all the parameters that I would have running get VM. And this is the after. So I'm going to reach in the oven, pull out the, the finished cake. Which in, let me show the right line here. So in this case, I went through and cleaned up the help a little bit. It's always easier to delete stuff and then just copy and paste in my new examples. Oh, my, this, um, <clears throat> this copy command script, or that function, will also detect if the command that you're copying comes from a module it will make that a requirement. So it detected that this was not from one of the standard out-of-the-box Microsoft.PowerShell 
modules and requires Hyper-V, so it automatically inserts that for you. Remember, lazy. <laughs> I don't want to have to think too much. So <clears throat> the, re the, the reason that I wrote this particular command is I use Hyper-V all the time. And I'm running get VM. But I want to know what VMs are running. I don't, I'm tired of having to type get VM, typing the where object or the state equal. So I just want a version of get VM that has a parameter. I can't remember what I called it now, and I can't see that. Um, called state. State equals running. So I've made that the default. You'll also notice, and this. Once you go to add stuff, yeah, that's where you gotta earn your paycheck. Yeah. So I did a little work and I discovered the class name for that state is that. It's an enum. And the advantage is, instead of making that a string or anything, by going that route and identifying the enumeration, I get IntelliSense. Okay? How cool is that? <clears throat> so that is a new parameter that get VM doesn't know about. So here's how we fix that. So I have some verbose messages. I remove that state parameter, right? Because get VM is not going to know that from PS bound parameters. And then I, <clears throat> this is a really simple version to why I'm showing it to you. I then modify the script command, basically say, go ahead, go ahead and run the initial command, but then filter it to where object state it was running. So I don't have to rely on having to type that all out. I can give this to someone else and they want to say, find me all the VNs that are paused. They can do that without having to understand how to pipe to where and, and know what to type. Because we've got the IntelliSense, it's all brain dead simple. That command, that wrapped, that script command, then gets thrown to the pipeline. Everything else in GetVM works just fine the way I expect it to be. Now, what I don't know, oh, let's see if that even works. Let's, let's do this here first, just to show you. Let's look at help. So all the parameters and stuff are copied over from uh, get VM, and you can see my state parameter. And because I had that enum, PowerShell automatically expands all of that and shows me all the possible options. Kind of handy. And I, in my <clears throat> description, I say that it's a copy. <clears throat> now, what I don't know is if I can see on the network, let's find out here. There's my verbose. Oh, good, it worked. Because I'm going, because this virtual machine I'm running, they're trying to connect to the Hyper-V host, which is my laptop itself. And when you present, and when you ask stuff out, so I have a little switch to really make sure the networking all works. Good, it worked. So I didn't have to do anything, and now I have all the running VMs. State. So very easily, I created a copy of GetVM, made my little tweaks, tweak the help, done. You know, it didn't take nearly as long as if I had started with an empty PS1 file and manually had to type all that stuff up. Questions over, and, and this is you know kind of a one-way reason you would use a proxy function. I'm still calling the underlying command. If 
but I have tweaked it in a way. In this case, I've added a parameter. Yeah. What if instead of adding a parameter, you want to replace a parameter? So let's say like get 80 user. You always want it to be dash prop, you know, department title manager or something. But you do so you want you're wrapping or you're doing it, but now you're setting as a false value on a on a parameter that he already exists. How would you go about wrapping that? You could use PS default parameter. Well, but you always yeah, no, yeah. So if I go in the new command yeah. and I want to set a, well, yeah, it, it, it should override that. Or you can just explicitly in your command, because yeah. you can still splat something and specify additional parameters. Okay. It's not an either or situation. Okay, so those like if somebody tried to run it and his properties would show up, they tried to set other things. And you were also setting it with that override. Would it? Well, are we talking about the properties on the underlying say, user object? So, well, sorry, sorry. There's a command. Sorry, I'm trying to make a bad one. Um, get any user has a, a parameter called properties. Right. Right. And so if you if you set that in your wrapper, it's going to be a specific value. But then somebody calling it also tries to set that. What happens, or what's the? It right depends on how you've written your yeah, okay. command. You Hold on to, to to that thought. I have some active directory examples. Okay. We'll get to you later. Maybe you'll see something good that will okay. <clears throat> answer that. That was just one example I'm wondering about. Yeah. They shouldn't be able to override anything unless they open up the script file and modify it. Okay. All, <clears throat> all they're going to do is see your command. Right. I was, I was asking a way to write that to make it work that way. Well, you just, you just modify the help. Okay. And, and assign, for example, here, what I could do, <clears throat> let's go back to my, um, I need, even though this is default, I set a default to the computer name, let's say I know that my, let's see if this will work, I know that my Hyper-V host is Chicago P50, let's reload that. Um, class. Um, that may be an issue. Let's put in so we're going off the off script right now. But that's fine. That's how we learn things. I can't type and talk at the same time. I also hope that I'm running the right version of this. It's not passing through the computer name, which this is what someone was asking earlier. So let's, because <clears throat> it's I didn't specify, so the PS bound parameters. So what I might have to do then is, and I don't want to I don't want to totally delete. Oh, I don't. Wanna, Totally ruin my command here, but maybe I will. <laughs> We're going to do this. I'm going to just comment out this parameter. Just because I don't want to have to modify my original command too much. Because this is kind of what you're talking about with the properties, yeah, yeah. all right? I want, for my command, computer name to always be Chicago P50. So I don't want to even make that an option for them. So I remove that from the parameter. So now what I can do here 
is I could, I could add it. So let's do that. Let's do PS bound parameters add computer name. Right? And I should see that because I'm adding that before I display it. There we go. Um, I'm not quite sure. Oh, because I have some additional code in there <clears throat> that's still relying on the computer. Yeah. But, but, yeah. So that's what you could do. You would just remove properties from your pro from your okay. your version of get a user, and then just hard code in whatever other commands you want. Would, it, would another way to do that would be to examine the collection that you could, is the value of the, the properties? Sure. I mean, if you want you to leave, you could leave properties in there, and if it doesn't have, yes, then you could add yes, something. Yes, that's the example was make sure, and I think that would be the wrong way to do it, make sure that those three always show up regardless of what else they add to the property. Right, a couple different, couple different ways that you could, could do that. <clears throat> All right, let's um, move on here because I'm amazed an hour's gone by already. Or this is another version of get my VM. Parameters and stuff are all the, the same. Except this is now a wrapper function. So it's not a proxy. So basically all I'm doing is saying take whatever parameters come through PS bound parameters and then just splat it in the process block. And that's it. It took like no time to create an entire working function. Can you go back and show the line that you were running before? Show the which line? Oh, that to create this? Yes. So I just ran my command, my copy command function. So so I can get VM, the new name, include dynamic just in case. Done. So it's the as proxy one, the replacement for the older. Yeah, but the proxy, if you do as proxy, then it creates a proxy command version with the step over pipeline and the rest stuff. There used to be a separate function for that, right? Right, right. The first command, get command metadata yeah. that I wrote, just does proxy functions only. This version, copy command, because that's what it does. It allows me to copy an existing command, and I can either create a proxy version of it or a wrapper version of it. Which kind of brings me to my next question and <clears throat> talk about which is better. Why would I want to use a proxy function, and maybe why would I want, want to use a wrapper? Anyone? Yeah. Well, what you're doing if you don't use the steppable thing is that you're actually invoking the inside command multiple times, and the behavior's not always going to be the same. Okay. Which may or may not be depending on what you need to accomplish. That's a, and that's why I want to have this quick little discussion here is to, <laughs> there may or may not, actually, the only way you're going to know which is the right version is to probably do both and test. Um, it may also depend on how much you need to add or delete. Do you need to put in stuff, you know, I have to ensure that these certain things are met. How much more difficult is that? Um, proxy functions I find a little harder to troubleshoot because everything's kind of nested in those steppable pipelines versus the wrapper function I mean, if you look at my, at the wrapper version that we just created in Untitled 7, and my mouse, this is really simple. So there are a number of things that you have to, again, and also think about who's going to use the command, 
Are you going to be piping stuff to it? Um, will they need access to other commands or they may be part of like the get VM side? I don't know. So you have to kind of make those decisions. But I have a tool now that you can use to do go both ways. And you can d decide. And it does not take very long to create something totally new. So here is the finished version of get my VM 2 which is the, the wrapper version. So in this case, I put, I hard coded in the computer name. Um, I removed the state because get VM doesn't understand that. And I, you know, I'm not sure I tested this when I created this just the other day. So let's test it. The default behavior should be to display all the running virtual machines on Chicago P50. <clears throat> and again, I didn't, I didn't put in my, oh, let's do this with verbose, because I bet I'm having that same issue with the PS bound parameters. Oh, not clear screen verbose, that's kind of silly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I, so I got to test everything, and then I, I modified it, but I didn't go back and test it. So I need to go through and do the same things I did before, and probably just get rid of computer. Well, no, because I still want to give them the option, but I want it to default. So I need to do some other magic. So I'll, have to, I'll tweak this before I publish it or, or share it with all my demo stuff and you can see how I solve that. Because in this particular case, I want them to be able to specify something else. But in addition. In addition, but have it default to the current one. So I, I'll have to go back in and look at that. All right. Well, your bladders are all holding up okay? Because we still have like 50 minutes, right? Um, okay, I'm going to quickly go through this. Because a variation on the copying commands will, would be to create commands based on sim classes. So instead of mucking around with CDXML, unless you just really hate yourself, <laughs> create either proxy or wrapper functions using get sim instance for whatever class you need. Now, the nice about get sim instance, <clears throat> the reason I like the wrapper is because I then can very quickly either use computer name or sim session. I don't have to try to generate the right parameters for that to happen. So I have some tools. So you, you could just, again, you could use the same idea of using copy command for get sim instance and create a proxy function. Let's call I have called get sim OS. Because the goal will be to create, to use get some instance, win 32 operating system, and return a preset value, preset um, collection of parameters, of properties, sorry. So the final version of that, that's the command, again, going into the oven, is this. We'll just minimize the help. So I didn't have to write all that code for the parameters for computer name and sim session. I have my verbose output. I'm adding, in this case, I'm adding particular parameters for the class name and the namespace. And I'm then splatting that. And I'm also doing something a little extra where I am inserting a type name for the output. Because at the end of my script here, I have some additional code that I wrote to update the type data and format data. So this is all in one. You could build this in a module. I have, just for the sake of demonstration, 
all in one script. So if I run that, that loads function adds all that type information. And let's see if this will work now. So the default should be for the local computer name. Computer name. Four zero one, not zero. That's why. And if I were to just show you, I pipe that to get member, you'll see that it's my custom type that added all that information. I could create sim sessions and pipe them to get sim OS. So I wrote it in basically to mimic get sim instance but returns the information I want. So now I have a tool I can give the help desk, oh, if you need to find out operating system about the computer, run this command, give a computer name, you're done. So get sim instance was kind of useful. And I also have, <clears throat> um, oh, this version, I was created a version that is a wrapper. There's really, and it does the same <clears throat> Same thing. There's really no benefit that I can tell one way or the other, at least in this particular case. Only that one might be easier to understand or troubleshoot if you're looking at code or kind of new to PowerShell. <clears throat> and I'm also going to share with you because I'm feeling, you know, like that kind of guy. And we have the time. I have another tool accelerator that I call a my sim script maker and this is going to use a lot of the same ideas about creating a wrapper function except in this case it is specifically for get sim instance and I'm just going to run it and show you how this works well you'll see the results you can look through the code and discover how it works And this is just, it only takes one parameter, the computer name. <clears throat> because you may want to build a, a command that's going to query a remote computer that has sim classes that don't exist on your computer. What this script is going to do, and this just kind of cheats and uses up grid view as an object picker, is it's going to fail. <laughs> I think I hit it, yeah, yeah, that's... So <clears throat> first thing that the, the script does is enumerates all of the namespaces on your computer or whatever computer you specify. So I'm going to pick root sim v2. It then enumerates all the classes within that namespace. <clears throat> and I just use out grid view because that was the easiest GUI tool to do an object picker. I, I could go through and do WinForms or WPF with that. I'm lazy, right? And then I can find the class that I want. So let's do oh, like Win32. Now let's do service. I could filter, but I'm committed at this point, so. <laughs> Uh, I have an option here if you want to test the class, which will basically enumerate or get an instance back. Most of the time I'm going to assume that you know what the class is ahead of time. So I'm not going to test it. Um, I can filter. So let's say I want to build a, a command that's going to filter on the, let's see, for WMI, it's the status, no, is it start name? No. The state. Where's state? Oh, 
here, the nice thing about our grid view. There we go. Click on the column headings. So I'm going to filter on state. And by default, it's going to be equal. And then this is going to pop up a little VB script style and running. I can then select the properties I want to display. Let's just do description, name, status, start mode, path name, start name. And then it creates a new command. It saves to the clipboard. And let's let me come here and paste it in. <clears throat> Generates a quick little help. Puts in all of the parameters. Now, I still may need to, to test this and tweak this a little bit, but all of that grunt work is done. I just had to go through some, basically a wizard, to pick what I wanted. Remember, lazy. Um, now, yeah, I mean, it took me some time to build the first tool, but now you don't have to, to do it. So, win for you. <laughs> so, this is another way, basically, I built a wrapper function. I'm sort of running get some instance, but everything else that I want to do, it's all done for me. I didn't have to create any of this code really from scratch, as you saw. All right, questions before I get into the last part here and we look at some other uh, before and after tools. No, we're all good? I'm just curious, have you ever built anything to wrap um, command line executables? Um, I have done things to I mean, take the output. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's a little tricky because you're not really wrapping. Uh, yeah, I've done some stuff with like netstat to build a command that would run netstat and then parse the output. Yeah. So you could do that. I don't have anything, any cheats like yeah. these. Yeah, they because every output would be would be different. And hopefully, you know, there are PowerShell versions or tools to do what you might have been using a camera tool for. Not always, but <clears throat> all right, so here is let's run, take a look at my <clears throat> get my AD user. So I wrote this function, this is a, let's just hide the help here. And this was created using my copy command for get AD user and it automatically got all of the default parameters because from being dynamic. Most of these should look the same, except it made a few changes. One, I wanted to be able to search for users in multiple OUs. The default for get AD user for, for get AD user, the search base only takes a single string. Yeah. I wanted multiple locations. So I modified, as you can see there, and put in take an array. Why not? Who's in charge here, you know? <laughs> and I also wanted the ability to exclude user accounts by some pattern. And you'll see, that I'll, I'll do a demo here so you can see how that works. Everything else is pretty much copied over from get AD user. What I had to do was remove the parameters that get AD user doesn't know about, like exclude. Now it knows about search base, But what I ended up doing here, now this is not a proxy function, this is a wrapper. So here's a reason, and one of the reasons I did this was because I have, notice I have a for each that's basically looping through 
the, string, the, the collection of OUs. That would be really hard to do in that steppable pipeline thing, trying to piece that out. This is much easier, at least for me. What were some of the use cases that you had for the current putting those features? Um, actually, this, I think I wrote this. Someone posted something in a form, and they were trying to search for users in multiple locations. Why wouldn't they just not specify a search base? They, because they didn't want to search the entire Active Directory of you, so they've got you know 100,000 users, sure. but all they care about the user could be in one of three OUs, which limits them to maybe only searching a thousand user accounts. So they wanted a way to fine tune and restrict where they search. Does this work meaningfully different than simply including my search bases as strings and then iterating in a for each block and calling getting to users? You could do that too, exactly, but th that that requires you to have more knowledge of how PowerShell work to work. I'm just work. curious if this runs faster than, than, than something like that. Or if it's still I, I don't know if it necessarily runs faster, but it's easier to type, to, to run the command. Because I just have to run, get my AD user and specify the parameters. Absolutely. So all I'm doing is hiding all of yeah, what you could do manually. <clears throat> There's not necessarily a performance gain in, the, in, in terms of getting the end result. It's just a matter of ease of use for whoever might need to use this <clears throat> tool. So actually, let's, let's see if this is going to work. <clears throat> so let's dot source that. <clears throat> okay, so I got, now this does require the Active Directory module. Now, if I look at help for get ad user, the original command, you'll notice there is no parameter for exclude, right? Nothing up my fancy sleeves here. But my version, my copied version, does have, and I added help for it, to, which you should be doing. And you can also, I'm going to compare some parameters. So I'm going to get the parameters for get AD user and my, my get my AD user. That's another little way if you want to prove what's different between two things. All right, so exclude is the only difference. Although I know for a fact that search base is different. So search base in the original is just a string and in my version you can see it's a collection of strings. That's just kind of to prove things. <clears throat> so I'm going to build a hash table. I want to filter on I'm going to find all user accounts where the department is equal to engineering. I want to search in either the employees or the research engineering locations and that's it. And I want to get the title and department back. So let's, this is not using the exclude piece. If I were to do this and splat that to get AD user, that fails because the search base says, hey, you're trying to tell me to do more than I'm designed to do. Fine. Be that way. I'm in control. So <clears throat> there was the result. So I searched using the AD user, and I just had my wrote my own little code very quickly. That when I made the copy of the command, the only code I had come up with was really just that little bit in process block. All the other boring, mundane stuff which you have to have anyway, I copied over. So, and that ran pretty quickly, considering I have like 5,000 plus user accounts in my domain. And if you want to see how the exclude works, so I want to find all users in the domain, except, oh, so, so the exclude is actually for a particular container. I want to find all users that have a name like Joseph, but skip anything that's in the testing OU. 
Because get AD user has no way to do that. And that's actually probably a more typical use case. I want to find something, but I want to ignore. There's no easy way to do that in with get AD user. You take a long, a complicated command. So, but I put that in. Um, another before and after. <clears throat> I wrote a, I, I copied my, I copied get history and came up with a new version called, I call it get my history. And what I have done is added parameters whoop, to specify a regex or unique, because by default, get history will show me everything. And I have two use cases. One, I want to, I want to do get history, but I want to filter out all the duplicates. So just show me the unique ones. Yes, I know you could do that manually, typing out the long command, but I, I'm just going to screw that up more than likely. Or my other use case was, I know I, I wrote a command and it had this pattern. So I wrote a <clears throat> parameter and added some code into the wrapper to use irregular expressions to get the history where the pattern matches the command line. Okay? Again, I don't want to have to try to remember how to do all of this manually at the console or rely on someone else to know what to type. I want to build a tool that they can use using copy command. Again, generated all the boring, mundane stuff. Then I just had to write the little fun pieces, like regex. Oh, I also wrote another version called show history. That will, I'm not quite sure what that does. Oh, you can play with that. Yeah, yeah, well, well we can look at it. Um, I was just gonna demo get my history. So I can find all of the commands that have a pattern. Because I wanted to know, show me all the lines where I defined a variable. There we go. Yeah, you have to know what the regex pattern is, but that was really easy to type to run the command. And I built a better wheel. Uh, I did another, so I'm not going to do the cop command, I'll just go right to the final object, the final uh, result. So I built another, this was before version five came out. How many of you have ever used T object? That's a pretty handy commandlet that I don't think a lot of people take advantage of. With T object, you can run it and get the command at the console, and you can save it to a variable or to a file. I'm not satisfied. I said, I need it to also go to the clipboard. Because I do a lot of writing, and often I need to run the command, I need to copy the results to the clipboard so I can paste it into my document that I'm working on. And I don't want to have to go extra steps to run the command and the copy. I don't want to be able to see it. So I wrote a version called tMyObject that adds a parameter to specify the clipboard as an option. So I just copied T object and went through and added a parameter. I defined a new parameter set. And I also ended up specifying the width through some trial and error. Uh, if I do the clipboard, I also, <clears throat> in this case, I again, remember I wrote this before version five, so I'm not using any of the V5 clipboard commandlets. 
So I'm using the actual Windows form to .NET stuff to do the clipboard copy. You could modify. What I found, you see some other regular expression stuff. When you copy stuff to the clipboard, I was getting a lot of empty space at the end, which screwed up when I pasted it into a document. So I've got some regex to clean that up. So I added all that. Again, this is just a wrapper. But now if I run this, and let's just do, oh, let's do this, get my VM T my object clipboard. And there we go. So it's still, so I, I wasn't satisfied with the wheel that T object gave me. Like, it, it was close, it was so close. All I had to do was to add one more parameter and I would be happy. Well, Microsoft's not gonna make that change for me, so I did. A lot of the stuff that I write, either as a result of something that I need for either training or because of writing or something that comes across in a forum, and we're going to say, well, a lot of people would probably have that issue. I can use it then as a teachable moment. So like the Active Directory example. Came out of a forum problem. Said, ah, that's kind of an interesting. Let me see what I can come up with. And now I have something you have. You'll have something you can actually use. Uh -oh, they're having fun next door. Yeah, but they're not fixing tea. You're just, yeah. all right, so 11.30. Questions, that's kind of the end of my official demos. Let me, here, let me, let's go back to the slide just so I can be totally efficient here, or at least cover all the bases. We can always come back to this. So hopefully you saw a little magic there. Questions? over anything that I showed you. I'm actually, well, not exactly what you showed me. I'm just curious if you've ever seen this. Oh, you'd be surprised. Okay. <laughs> or just a, so um, one of the things that I tried to do a while ago is to try to duplicate the behavior of the Dura command from cmd.exe into PowerShell that a bunch of people who absolutely would not use PowerShell as their shell solely because they were used to DIR and all the weird ass ways you could use it in cmd.exe. And of course, that was just like an unending. Uh, Is it because they wanted to use a slash instead of the dash? They would use a slash, they would not have to put a space between the slash and DIR slash. Yeah, there's, there's no way you can, to PowerShell's parameters are going to expect a dash. Yeah, yeah. It's a, there's no way, no way around that. Um, but I'm just wondering if you've seen anything that gets close to make those people happy. I don't know, has anyone else seen anything like that? I, I mean, it was one way to do it is when you open up PowerShell, just type in CMD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I. Yeah, I, I thought that I had written a, some other directory. I, I know a number of commands, scripts, and functions to get better results for um, the jerk command. Not necessarily as complete replacement. I thought I had something. Uh, I'll, I'll look. Okay. It's, it's all right. It's fine. It's just, it was a case where we were finding ourselves having to write you know, lists of scripts and things for our developers in both. You know, things that work with CMD.exe and PowerShell. They just need yeah. to get over it. Well, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to fix the person than it is. Well, I mean, that's yeah. easy to say, hard to do. Other questions? Yeah. So this is, this is maybe more of a comment than a question. Okay. What you're doing here is it, it's, re it's really exciting, by the way. It fits into the general category of code generation, mm -hmm. right? Of automatically generating code. And one of the knocks against code generation, 
has always been that you know you you make this new copy of a bunch of code and then you tweak it here and you tweak it there, but now you're sort of stuck. So if the original mechanism by which you generated that copy changes, like you showed how you yeah, yeah. little curly braces around the names, right? You're now stuck because you have to reapply all that stuff. Yeah, and it, one it, of the it, way, yeah, you build a command yeah. that's built on say Microsoft command line, and Microsoft in the next version of PowerShell introduces a breaking change, yeah, you may have to go back and, and absolutely. The only, the only note is that the more of these automatic tweaks you can build into your original script, and the less you have to tweak afterwards, the better off you are if you have to rerun this thing later, right? And that would be an, a situation where using the proxy command is maybe a better approach, because you're not relying so much on the command, you're going to just send it to parameters. Your changes go in modifying that script CMD script block. So if you are, if that is concerned, then a proxy approach would probably be the, the better way to go. But certainly. And I write stuff like this primarily because a lot of IT pros don't like to type, they're not very good at it. They know they should write a script, but you guys are all, you know, you crunch for time. You want, and that's when people, they post in a form, I need a script to do X. Well, we're not going to write a script for you, but let me give you something that will help speed up the process. So I'm always trying to find shortcuts and ways to take the pain away and the, the grunt work so that you will put in comment-based help. Because you don't have to do anything, it's just going to copy, you just have to then edit what's already there. And editing is a whole lot easier than typing it from scratch, right? So, you know, assuming, you know, everyone's here basically IT pros, and you're crunched for time, you needed this yesterday, and I don't have time to sit and write a complete thing from scratch, I don't, I'm still learning. You still need to know PowerShell and understand some of the things, but you could run my command to generate the new version of your wheel and hopefully then have enough information. Or if you get stuck and you post in the forum and say, I've got this version of my, this, I'm building this script that basically is wrapped around get AD user and run into a problem, how can I get around that? So then you just focus on little pieces that you want to change and not worry about the rest of the stuff that you need. There's another question over here. So we just stretch an arm. Here. When you built the, the uh, dynamic parameters over, any logic associated with those dynamic parameters was was maintained there? Oh, that's a good question. Because um, if you've got something like get ad user, it does dynamic parameters associated with that. No, you know that, that that's a good point. The and I'll have to test that. Um, for example, the dir command has the dynamic parameters for file and directory. If you're in the file system, you get those parameters, but not if you're in the registry. So if I were to build a, well, let's just, uh, how much time do we have here? Uh, I'll, I'll work on that. Um, the include dynamic parameters is at least getting the name. It's not actually building a true dynamic parameter which a true dynamic parameter has logic, has some sort of code to say, if this condition is met, then bring this along. The main reason I had to include dynamic was to get around the Active Directory issues. Because for whatever reason, they, those command lists are, and I don't know why, well, because they know what they're doing, but I don't know what logic is saying make this dynamic. Because it's not dynamic in the way, like I'm in the file system, so make this parameter available. They decided that all their parameters are just going to be defined as dynamic, which is a little bit different. But you're right. I don't know if my copy command, I know it doesn't make a true dynamic parameter, it just gets the name, identifies it. So you would, you could still make it dynamic if you need to. You have to go back and add that piece back in. That's a very good point. Other questions? 
Was any of this useful or magical or? As I said, I do all my writing um, at pretty much at Petri or on my blog, uh, Partial and Depth, Second Edition. Oh, no, if, I guess some people brought books, which is kind of a good thing, I, I, because this is one of the few times that Don and Richard and myself are all in the same time zone and the same location. So if you brought books for people to sign, I meant to tweet that out, you know, do it, because this is the time. And this is, a, you know, other people, they told me, bring your Mark books, and he'll sign. So I see some books down here. Um, so this is a great time. So um, I don't know if, I can't remember if we covered proxy editions in partial and depth. Um, is it in there? You know, three of us wrote this book, and I don't know what's in it. <laughs> I know the stuff that I wrote. And. Proxy, proxy functions, yeah. So there's stuff on proxy functions in there. And I think there's some stuff on proxy functions in the tool making book. Um, partial deep dives, I'm going to give a plug here for this book. This is also published by Manning. I was the editor, which I will never do again. Um, a variety of partial MVPs, Microsoft people, people very active in the partial community. This book grew out of some of the original PowerShell deep dives and summits. This is a book that is basically this conference, but in a book. So the chapters are all written by someone active in PowerShell. They're all little niche topics. You will not find that information anywhere else. And what made this kind of special is no one got paid. This is all the proceeds for this book go to charity. So you should buy two copies. Uh, if you go to Manning and order and buy the book there on, on the Manning website, you can get the, I believe you get all the ebook versions for free. So don't go to Amazon if you want the ebook versions. Um, anyway, so plug for that because it's for charity and you will learn stuff about PowerShell that you won't learn anywhere else. And then my contact information, if you need me, um, I'll be here the rest of the day and <clears throat> all day tomorrow. Uh, that's where I blog. Uh, you're welcome to email me. I also have business cards if you need that sort of thing. Pretty active on Twitter. You can kind of find me on Google Plus every other day or something. Um, on Twitter, let me point, mention, also mention this. Um, Adam Bertram and I, on the first Friday of every month, host, host kind of, a PowerShell chat on Twitter. That's uh, first Friday of every month, 1 p.m. Eastern time to 2 p.m., I don't know. So we just get online, we use the PS tweet chat hashtag, and we just kind of answer questions or chat and find out what people are working on. Or, so if you want to hang out or just even kind of lurk and see what people are working first Friday of every month, um, I try to send out some tweets, you know, before that to remind people, but something else to think about. Anything else? I will make, I, I will tweet once I get all this stuff up and online, but it might not be till next week. Um, questions? So I'm just going to ask if it would be on your blog or? Yeah, I'll, I'll post something eventually also on my blog. Um, I'll have to, everything will go in a zip file, uh, might go in a Dropbox link, but I mean, eventually I'll share the, the link. Uh, they, I don't know, I got to talk to Richard to see if they want it here, or maybe the conference website, but maybe a couple places, but yeah, let me package everything up. Um, I want to fix a few things. All right, so thanks. Uh, do the evals. Uh, make sure we clear out of here right away. That way, good, we'll have plenty of time. We'll keep Don happy. All right, thank you very much.